Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Now, before we get started, if you're enjoying the knowledge nuggets I'm dropping here in my shows and just digging when I'm screaming, then smash that like button and subscribe and spread the word to all your friends about the best wine show anywhere. I purchased this wine, the 2014 Chateau de Brizy Clos de la Rue from Somme Select back in January of 2019 for 45 bucks. I'm going to take a somewhat deep dive into things here. There's a lot of info to cover. During all this, I'll have my usual maps and picks. All right, the Chateau is located in a region called Saumur in the Loire Valley. It is best known for traditional sparkling wines known as Cremant in France and red wines made from Cabernet Franc. Depending on what wine is made, the following AOPs are used. Saumur, white, red, or rosé, Sommier Champagne Red, Coteau de Sommier Sweet Wine, Sommier Mousseau Sparkling, Cabernet de Sommier for Rosé wines produced before 2014. It's Sommier Rosé for 2016 and afterwards. The research for this wine sent me down a few rabbit holes, many of which made things more confusing. Typically, I would just use the notes from Somme Select, there's a link in the description, and just be done with it. However, I wanted to know more. And that is where the confusion, at least for me, started. First, there is the chateau itself, Chateau de Brizy, a true castle. I went to the chateau's website to get the history. The property dates back to 1063 with the first mention of a chateau. It is owned by the Brizy family for hundreds of years from at least 1063 to 1318 when Jean de la Tang of Brizy family marries Pont de Mailly. The Mailly Brizy family would continue to own it for another 300 years. It gets a bit murky because the Conde family takes over in 1650 in a marriage, but then the property gets traded with Thomas Daru. At this point, it's then considered part of the Daru Brizy family. All right, so they own the property until the marriage of Charlotte de Daru Brizy and Bernard de Colbert in 1959. The Colbert family are descendants of Jean-Baptiste Colbert, who was a famous minister under Louis XIV. Just in case you're not up on your French monarchy, he reigned in uh, 1643 to 1715. I didn't know how to look it up. In 1998, they decided to open the chateau to the public. And in 2001, the underground fortress is also open to the public. So basically the Brizzy family and its descendants are still involved, but the website words it in a slightly confusing way and maybe whomever, whomever translated it. I've got a link to their website so you can read all the details. But what adds to my confusion is that the Colbert family is said to have purchased the site in 2009. So what happened in 1959? I, I'll, I'll get to that soon. So what's not mentioned during all this history? The wine, at least not on the website. But check this out. They've been making wine from the vineyards on the property since at least the 1400s, according to Somme Select site. Wines from here, were considered some of the best white wines in all of France. These wines were traded with wines from arguably the greatest dessert wine in France, Chateau de Kemp. The Chateau's wines have a lot of pedigree, at least historically. Back to more history. So further digging on the importer site, in the case that Arnaud Lambert, the winemaker for this wine, signed a 25 year contract with the Colbert family to manage the 20 hectares of vineyards and make wine from them. So this may be where the confusion is. By the way, the company that imports the wine is called The Source. Starting in 2009, Lambert began the process of converting the vineyards to biodynamic, starting with going organic first. This is a common practice as going straight from conventional farming to bio is considered too risky. Going organic first allows the soil to be reborn in a way. Conventional farming kills the topsoil according to those that practice organic and bio. I'm not disagreeing with them. I'm just saying that I haven't really heard those who farm conventionally saying that their topsoil is alive. So the soil of the vineyard is called tufo. I'll quote Psalm Select here for this part. 
The hill of Brzee is full of a soil known as tufo, made from fossilized sea organisms compressed over tens of millions of years. This soil is very similar to the chalky soils found in Chablis and Champagne, and similarly yields wines which are incredibly mineral driven. Though Brzee vineyard sprawls across dozens of acres, Claude de la Rue is one of their many walled parcels that traps warmth and blocks whipping winds, allowing for more phenolic development and slightly richer wines. Within this insulated zone, 30 and 60 year old vines are buried in sandy limestone soils with deep layers of clay in the region's signature tufo. Okay, so I've given you quite a bit of backstory here. I have links below to everyone's websites to get more detail. The source's two links are filled with details that I honestly glossed over in order to get these notes done. One final note before we get into the wine. Prior to the 2018 vintage, there can be two labels for the same wines. There are Domaine Arnaud Lambert wines, and then there are Chateau de Brise wines. I didn't find this out until I visited the sources site and read the first article I've listed below in the description. Once that happened, everything lined up as I was seeing two different labels. Now it's just one. I'll be honest, I kind of like the older label, but what do I know? If, if the wine is as great as all this backstory says, who cares? Oh, so, and the source sells the 2016 for 60 bucks. Before I get into this wine, I wrote this script three or so days before recording this. I've had some more time to think about today's wine and my next wine I'm reviewing. Wines from the Chateau have the potential of becoming iconic. I talked about how these wines were viewed in the past, 100 plus years ago. Arno has the potential of making some killer wine here. I was going over some things yesterday and the other wine I have from Arno in my collection popped up. I decided to look at that one on, up on his site. Of course, the label looks different too, but it is the same wine. Anyway, the PDF of the details for that wine has this map. The map includes all the clove vineyards for Chateau de Brise. However, the other wine that I'm talking about comes from a non clove vineyard in the same village. Not sure if they are part of the Chateau or not. They are part of the Brise Hill that has excellent vineyards though. No matter, just seeing all the vineyards are no farms really drove home the following. This is from the second link from their importer, The Source. The owner of The Importer was visiting Arnaud and they were having dinner with Romain Guibertot. Romain is a highly respected producer who makes wines from the same hill. Quote, after we tasted, Romain needed a smoke. So he and I went outside and started the chat while Arnaud stayed in the cave to organize a few wines to taste. Romain took a long draw off his cigarette and leaned into me as though he was going to tell me a secret. He quietly said in French, yes, I have one, Claude de Carmes, of the greatest vineyards on the hill. He has the other eight. He stared at me as, it, as he pointed his finger towards the cellar where Arnaud was and continued, he's a great winemaker and he's just getting started. My vineyards have been in organic culture already for over 10 years and he's just converting them now. Just wait, he's the one to watch. He has them all. Let that sink in. Arnaud is almost halfway into his contract with Chateau Brise. One of his peers, who is highly respected, is effectively in awe of Arnaud. Not jealous, not envious. He just sees the potential. All right, so let's get into the stats on the wine. So the 2014 Chateau de Brise Claude de la Rue Samur Blanc for 45 bucks from Somme Select. 100% Chenin Blanc. The soil is too faux. They use organic farming. 30 to 60 year old vines. No mallow lactic, which means it keeps the acidity high and the wine bright. 12 months of oak aging with about 35% in new French oak. Move to stainless steel tank afterwards for six months to settle. Projected drinking window is 2020 to 2030 plus. So maybe I lucked out waiting almost two years over this bad boy. All right, and now with without further ado and hype, let's get into this wine. Whoop. Gotta make sure everything's still recording anyway. Put a new gas capsule into the Coravin. All righty. I'm excited about trying the other wine this guy makes, the Cremant, which is probably going to be either the, I'm gonna use it either for my Christmas or New Year's. 
episode now that I know a little bit more about this. So I'm excited to try it. Man, I can already smell it. All right. So definitely highly aromatic. It's got six years of age. I wouldn't necessarily call it um, youthful, but there is a touch of age to it, but it still smells pretty fresh and bright. However, I do get a little bit of bruised apple and bruised pear and bruised um, peach. Almost a peach skin. Now, for me, peach is typically the overriding fruit in Chenin Blanc. So when I'm blind tasting, if I get a preponderance of peach, I hopefully am thinking Chenin Blanc. However, that's not necessarily what the wine is. We also got that peach skin, that peach fuzz, a little apricot. Yeah, definitely apricot. A little fig to it. So, and all the fruit is in that slightly ripe nature. It's not really overly ripe, though I, I did say some of it was bruised. So it was more of an oxidized thing here going on. And there's a little bit, I didn't really talk about the color, but there is a little bit of golden color to this. So that could be from bottle aging or could just be, that's what it looks like. Yeah, a little bit of bruised quality to the fruit. Now, as far as do I smell like the oak aging? No, but that also could just be that it's it's got a little bit of time so it and it's settled in tank before it got released or before it got bottled. So it may have mellowed out the oak. I might taste it on the palate. Let's get into that. Where do I start? This wine is effing good. So the fruit remains that kind of bruised quality. You have this red apple, this peach, this pear, um, some nectarine now, the, apric the apricot, apricots there, a little bit of fig. You get the peach skin, the peach fuzz. So all that, and it's actually a little bit tartar in tart tartar in nature, but it's probably also due to the high acidity that's coming through on this. So my mouth is just absolutely watering. It is like going for days. This is a wine based on the acid alone will easily age another ten years. So I am just now getting to probably the the good time to taste this, you know, I'm not saying I agree with the Psalm select drinking window, but wow, this, this wine is, it's, it's got some complexity. It's also got some just strength. It's not a full bodied or bold wine, but it's definitely got that structure. There's a little bit of oxidized or, or kind of not quite dead floral to it, white flower. There's a little bit of candle wax to it. There might have been a touch of botrytis here going on in the vineyard during that year. I'm not sure. There's a somewhat candy-fied, but it's like a sweet tart type of thing. Almost like a sour. It's definitely the fruit is the dominant thing. But there's a little bit of wax. I would even say like, you know, like candle wax, um, a little bit of lanolin. So there's probably a, a touch of botrytis in here somewhere. I mean, now that I'm thinking of try this, now I'm looking for the other things like ginger, like candy ginger. I think it's there, but it didn't come through initially on the palate or on the nose. So I might be looking for these things, but there's definitely that quality to it. And man, the acid is super high. It's balanced. The wine is in balance and it's really well made, but wow. This wine is, this wine is really good.
I can get such like butterscotch and caramel, like a salted caramel. Yeah, like a little bit of salted caramel. And I'm gonna assume that that is part of the oak aging. I don't really get the usual thing of like vanilla, clove, cinnamon, uh, baking spice, Christmas spice, that kind of stuff. But there was that caramelization a little bit. So it might've come through from the oak, maybe in the toasting level of the oak. But this wine rocks. Wow. This is some super delicious wine. I could see like just letting it sit for a little bit longer, like seeing how long I can let it go. One, that's why Corvin's awesome. Like I've had, I've had a wine last for 18 months with just this much taken out and it was still perfect. So uh, I think I did a show about that. I'll put a link below for that show, um, the Don Melchor. But yeah, this wine is really, really good. So um, I got these, I got this note on my teleprompter. Does the wine live up to the hype? Yes. I would say it lives up to the hype or at least the hype that I've put into it. So it may have like influenced my opinion of the wine, but I'm telling you, if I drink this a little bit later, not like later tonight, but like tomorrow, the next day, a week, two, three weeks later, or bring it to Psalm Group just like as a bonus wine, because this is not technically testable. It's Chenin Blanc from the Loire, but when we, if we're getting a Samir wine, it's going to be Chenin, it's going to be a Cabernet Franc, not Chenin Blanc. But if I brought this to like as a bonus wine, they would love it. This is somewhat geeky, but it's absolutely delicious and totally approachable. You don't have to be a wine geek to appreciate it. But yeah, so all right, oh, so yeah, that's gonna do. That's gonna do it for today's show. Again, if you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe, and then tell your friends. I stumbled over everything, but anyway, until next time, I have no wine in the glass. We'll see you later. <laughs>